The next uh, speaker is uh, Ruth Baumeister. Um, uh, she is an architect, historian, curator, editor, and writer. She uh, received a PhD um, in architecture history from Delft University of Te Technology in 2009. And she studied architecture in Munich at the TU and in, at the City University of New York. And she did a postgraduate uh, at uh, ETH Zurich. And she's all also ta taught at the Bauhaus University in Weimar, which was the reason that she was here at the last Bauhaus uh, seminar that you can see online. Um, right now, she's teaching at the uh, Aarhus uh, School of Architecture in Denmark. And uh, Ruth's uh, title uh, is uh, on her lecture is Chasing Shadows, Le Corbusier and Denmark. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you very much, Lotte, for having me here. I very much enjoyed it last time with the seminar. Ruth, I um, really need to speak in, uh, yeah, right now. Okay, thank so, you. As I said, I very much enjoyed the seminar one and a half years ago. Um, I enjoyed it especially because I come from a purely <coughs> architecture school now, and I always feel being among um, artists is more fun. So um, <laughs> I, I really enjoy being here, and I enjoy the discussions. Um, as Lotte said, my contribution today stems from um, a work I did a couple of years ago. It was this show on Asker Jorn and Le Corbusier at the Museum Jorn in Silkeborg. And I will talk about one part, one aspect of um, what this show touched back then, and that is um, Le Corbusier and Denmark. And I would like, um, hold on. I would like to start with a little quote about the state of um, the development of modern architecture in Denmark, which um, the historian Tobias Faber um, wrote in his book in 1968, where he basically says that um, the state of the arts in bringing about modern architecture in Europe um, the role that Denmark um, had to induce this new development was um, rather minimal or negative. And um, he says in a very funny way almost, um, when in Denmark they first um, named the Bauhaus in the papers, Kropius, the founder, the famous founder of the Bauhaus had already um, left but let's um, look at how that went in relation to Le Corbusier, because as we um, heard in Thomas' brilliant lecture, he was also really one of the protagonists when it comes to developing modern architecture in the 1920s. Um, I would like to talk about different aspects of Le Corbusier and Denmark. And the first one will be about the discourse and network networks. Then I will talk about um, built architecture. And in the end, I will touch a little bit on art slash art industry. So let's start with the discourse. There were basically two major discussions in the Danish journals in the 1920s. One was um, in Architekten and one was in uh, um, a very um, short-lived periodical that was called Critisk Revue. But um, funnily, funnily, the very first one who basically brought Le Corbusier to Denmark was a Norwegian. Here um, you see him, Edvard Heiberg, who um, knew about Le Corbusier from uh, um, B. 
being in Paris in the 1920s and he visited him there and he was very fascinating, fascinated about him and wrote a first article that was something like a summary about Le Corbusier's um, theories which got published in the Norwegian magazine Bückekunsten and later on then a couple of years later, two years later as of um, as a matter of fact, got published in Architekten. And already there, Heibjerg was very positive about um, Le Corbusier and says um, Danish architects will gain greatly from immersing themselves in Le Corbusier's work. But as it turns out, if you look at how the Danes um, themselves reacted to that, it looks a little bit Different. One of them, um, P. Ho, Paul Henningsen, um, he talks about Le Corbusier's work when he um, writes a book review on Versun Architecture, Architecture in 1926, because then that book was um, available to Danish architects as it has been translated into German. And at that point, um, Danes could still read German and they would read Le Corbusier in German. And he basically, what his whole um, review about Le Corbusier says that um, in principle, Le Corbusier, he um, talks about economics, technical issues and all that. Um, but in the end, it's all about creating a new formal aesthetics. And um, he says then very um, explicitly when it comes to modern architecture, um, the Danes would um, put the, the focus on these things here before the hyphen, which is the social and the economical, um, rather than creating a new aesthetic. So he basically, he, re he relates to the Danish or maybe the Scandinavian tradition, which saw um, modernization and architecture less of a, um, of a formal or an aesthetic program or style, but more as a social um, instrument to create an equal society. But then I think most interestingly was um, Steen Elia Rasmussen, who in the same debate in Architekten basically um, sees, he, I would say he disguises Le Corbusier, like Thomas already said in his, um, in his lecture, that in the end it's all about him, Le Corbusier, creating architecture through art or as an artist, so to say. And um, this is what um, Rasmussen rightly um, sees in when he looks at his writings and at his work in the end. Um, he says Le Corbusier has to be um, admired as an artist and not someone who deals with um, the problems of modern housing or the city because he does that in a more superficial way. So if we go on to um, the networks um, Le Corbusier was part of, he was one of the very influential members of the Siam group. Um, as we heard already, it was a reunion of modern architects who also, as their primary goal, tried to solve the housing and the, um, the growth of the city. And they realized that it was impossible anymore at that point to do that on a national level. So they kind of created this international movement where they would make conferences and um, workshops in order to um, find solutions to the issues they had in front of them. And as I said before, Le Corbusier was a very important figure in that all. And besides that, of course, all um, the important figures in architecture at that time, you name it, it might be Mies van der Rohe, Cornelis van Eesteren, um, Aut, Gropius, they were all part of that membership and they had these yearly meetings. And in the German-speaking countries, 
um, to which Denmark at that time was very closely related. There was a group formulating um, within Siam that was called Neues Bauen. And at some point, Paul Henningsen, he received a letter from Siegfried Gideon, the historian who was the secretary of Siam, asking if Denmark wouldn't be willing to create a national group of Neues Bauen also that could then be an active part in the SIAM meetings. And it's very interesting if you read how Henningsen um, reacted to this request by, um, by Gideon, you would think that he would be flattered or excited to participate in this movement of the most um, important architects and urban planners at that point but he's rather um, skeptical and um, moves the task on to Edward Heiberg. And he writes him a letter um, saying that they want, to, they want us to create a, or formulate a group, but I think we shouldn't really um, start doing that unless we see first what is playing there, so to say. But in the end, they, um, they decided to make that group. And um, there is um, a conference then coming up um, for um, where the housing question will be, um, will be discussed. And um, the idea is that this whole new formulated group would travel to Frankfurt to be part of that. And the delegates of the group was Heiberg and Paul Henningsen. But they, um, in the end, had better things to do, so they didn't go. The only person from the whole Danish group who would attend the meeting was Hans Hansen. And it is very funny, he, be he was so, um, so shy, you would say, or so um, he didn't really talk up in the meeting at all. So if you read the meeting minutes, they say nobody of the Danish um, Neues Bauern group participated. So he didn't leave any trace. Then there was um, the next effort of the Siam people to try to get the Danes to activate the group. Um, for the next meeting in Brussels, they were sending a uh, um, Le Corbusier developed a questionnaire about the contemporary issues of house in housing that every group was supposed to fill in. But again, they were criticizing it. It was not good enough and it was superficial. So they didn't even get around to fill that in. And in the end, um, nobody went to that um, meeting either. And um, they received a letter um, to the Danish group saying, why um, don't they participate in the work? And that's, that was the end of the Danish involvement in Siam. So it really didn't um, get anywhere. Um, now, you would wonder, I called my um, presentation Day, um, Chasing Shadows, Le Corbusier and Architecture. And that is because um, as I showed here already in the discourses, um, Le Corbusier was not really talked about much or he was not really um, received very well. Also, one of the reasons was that I would say sometimes his kind of megalomanian um, ideas and his very his prophetic um, nature, how he presented himself, didn't work at all with the Danish context of Jentelon. <laughs> so that was one of the things. But um, he finally, as I said before, he didn't get to build anything. He didn't draw any, any, uh, um, any urban plans, like for example, he did for the city of Stockholm. So there was nothing really, no material um, trace of his work. And yet, and yet I would say, um, there are um, other traces, other ways he kind of infiltrated the Danish context of art and architecture, and I will um, show you some of these now. When it comes to architecture, here is an example um, to the left, the 
house of the future that was a mock-up um, presented as a, at a housing exhibition in, uh, um, in Copenhagen in 1927, and, um, or the, the house was developed between 27 and 29, and it was developed by, um, at, then, at that time, rather young Arne Jakobsen and Fleming Glassen. And you can see it has some kind of um, resemblances of the Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier um, that we just, um, that we have here on the right hand side. And that doesn't come from nowhere, I would say, because it is um, Fleming Lesson. He had a younger brother named Moens, and he, at that time when um, that was developed, he worked for a Danish firm in Paris and very was very much acquainted. He visited um, Le Corbusier more often and was very much um, fascinated by his work. So I would argue that there were some kind of correspondences and you can see where some of the um, some of the aspects of um, the house of the future um, comes from. Then if we look um, later on here a part uh, a design by Moens Lassen in from 1934 um, especially the villas he designed in the 1930s they have a lot of um, similarities with Le Corbusier's villas here you see the roof garden the longitudinal window and um, even more um, strikingly, the color scheme, which um, one's lesson for the whole um, building took from, um, from the, color, um, the color scheme that Le Corbusier in 1931 developed for um, Salubra. Here you have a couple of other examples where you really see it's almost a one-to-one -one, um, modification in these villas here, also um, Moens Lassen's own house. And it's not only related to the architecture himself, but um, Lassen also at that time was one of the first ones, I would say, who um, introduced steel tube furniture, seating furniture <coughs> to Denmark, which um, very clearly goes back to what he has seen um, in Paris, developed by um, Charlotte Perriot and Le Corbusier. But um, his kind of connection went on even after the war, when um, Le Corbusier did that turn to what we heard before, to the more brutalist architecture, experience-based architecture. Here you can see um, Le Corbusier's um, Maison Schule and um, a summer house that Lassen developed in Denmark in 1957, which has um, partially the formal language of the, um, the roof shape, but also some of the material qualities of um, that later work by Le Corbusier. But as I said, um, I would like to also um, talk a little bit about art and in this respect, especially about um, the Danish artist um, Aska Jorn, who um, in 1938 wrote that Le Corbusier is a man who has wasted thousands and thousands of Danish crowns on a series of failed experiments. He it is who has set his undeniable stamp on everything that today bears the name modern architecture. So um, you can see that he is very much, much fascinated and he basically assigns all the tribute or he gives tribute to the development of modern architecture to Le Corbusier. Now you would ask me, most of you probably know um, 
Oscar Jan as a kind of abstract ex ex expressionist painter, and you would say, what does this has to, or what does he have to do with architecture, or even more precisely, what on earth does Jan has to do with um, Le Corbusier? Now, there is a little episode in um, Jorn's development, which I think is probably more decisive than anything else later on. Um, Jorn grew up in the western part of Denmark in Jutland, and um, he wanted at a very early age become a painter, but he had to help sustaining the family and became uh, and got educated as a teacher. Um, he didn't do that very long, but he had the urge to learn more about art and decided to travel to Paris. He wanted to um, get into the studio. He wanted to learn with Kandinsky, whom he knew at that point um, from the Bauhaus books he was able to read in the library in his hometown, Silkeborg. When he was in uh, um, Paris, he had to realize that um, he, Kandinsky was too old, he didn't teach anymore, and he didn't really know what to do. He had very little money, he got stranded there, and he was already then a convinced communist and member of the Communist Party in Denmark. So what he did, he just went to the, um, to the Parisian um, office of the Communist Party and thought he would just see maybe he can meet someone there to help him further. And actually he did. He met someone who referred him to um, Fernand Lecher, the Cubist painter, and um, Jorn managed to get into his atelier. He was teaching um, individually at that point. And Lecher, as a matter of fact, he was a good friend of Le Corbusier and they did some um, collaborations or they, they worked together. Um, for example, um, Lecher did the artistic decorations of the um, Esprit Nouveau um, pavilion of the um, show there. You probably all know the pavilion where the tree um, grows through the building. So um, Jorn, he, um, he is with um, Lecher in the studio and he is running out of money and he needs a job. And so um, Lecher helps him. He says that there is this big world exhibition um, going on at the moment or being in preparation in Paris and um, there are people needed to help there. One of the big issues of the world um, exhibition was that this exhibition, um, there were an enormous amount of wall paintings because um, at that point it was the um, the popular front that was in power, the communists in Paris, and they were very much interested in bringing art out to the people. So they financed an enormous amount of, um, of wall paintings at this exhibition. And um, one of the projects that in a way also um, hooked on to that idea of um, communicating the political agenda also through wall paintings was the pavilion designed by Le Corbusier here in the middle. It was called um, Pavillon d'État Nouveau. It was about the new times. And what um, he did, Le Corbusier, in this pavilion, it was in a way like a big open book here on the right hand side, you can see you would go, the visitor goes through a set of ramps, walks through the buildings and he gets indoctrinated, I would say so now, by A, the political agenda of the Popular Front and B, um, Le Corbusier's idea about housing and urbanism. And for that um, 
respect, a lot of wall paintings had to be executed in this um, pavilion and Oscar Jorn was one of the young students, so to say, who received a job to help Le Corbusier there. So this is where they kind of got acquainted um, with each other. And Jorn, who, as I said in the beginning already, was a communist, was very interested in the fact that you, as an artist, can um, communicate an, a language also, or um, not a language, an idea um, in public if you, um, if you put it out in a building or in free urban space. And here I just um, put three examples to characterize Jorn as an artist a little bit for you, because of course I'm not sure that all of you know much about him. The one on the left-hand side I like very much. It's a kind of um, parody um, where he presents himself as um, Karl Marx with the big um, beard. And that, as I said before, um, dates to the fact that he is a communist. And interestingly enough, he never resigned um, from the Communist Party in Denmark even after um, the, the 1950s. He remained member of this party all of his life. But he was not so much interested in um, having polo politics, no mat matter which side, um, rule his artistic expression. So he was not into um, social realism or anything. What he was really interested in was art as a means to express things. And here you see him um, creating a, a ceramic mural. And he even does that with the little, um, with this Vespa, he writes on, um, on the clay in order to leave these traces in a very brutalist manner, you want to say so. And there is, around that time, he was living in uh, um, Italy, he was saying um, art doesn't need to be pleasing. Art for him was not about making something beautiful. It was about creating friction, about creating a sensation, about having people experience something. Then the other thing, one of my um, favorite self-portraits of his is a kind of a collage where he shows himself with this um, Borsalino, um, the um, uh, uh, straw hat you really don't need if you um, live in Denmark because you hardly ever see the sun that um, shows or dates to the fact that he was in it Italy um, living there all the time. He was in France and um, especially in the early times before the war he was very much um, enlightened or he was very much interested in the culture he encountered there. And when he came back in 1938, he wrote a lot of articles kind of putting dirt on the Danish art life. And um, he described it as um, hopelessly provincial, laid back and conservative. But at the same time, later on, he um, develops this kind of expat nostalgia, I would say, where he finds back to his um, Viking roots and goes into um, iconography of prehistoric um, art and all, the, all these things. So similar, um, like in Le Corbusier, where you have like the indulgent and the rational fighting in these two people, I would say with Jorn, it's always like the international and the national that he, um, he fights himself with. Now, at that point, um, when Jorn works with Le Corbusier, it is a very particular time or period, I would say, in Le Corbusier's life, because 
we already heard before that there was this issue with Le Corbusier about being a rationalist, being a, someone who is into function, into technology, being the kind of um, architect of this new time. Here you see him with the suit and um, the tie and the artist. And it was until that around that time that he basically he had trouble with his artistic practice and he almost he kept that as a secret. He would always in the morning go to his studio and paint and in the after lunch he would go um, to the architect's office and develop the projects but he would he would struggle very much with that because um, his artistic practice could not really be argued for in terms of what is needed, what is rational and all that. But that um, in a way turns around the mid 1930s and in uh, um, 38, just um, right around the time when Jorn encounters him, Le Corbusier has the first public exhibition at the Kunsthaus in Zürich of his artworks. And you could consider that or you could understand it almost like a, a coming out of him as an artist. And I always like to put these um, two images together because you can really see he wears these weird shoes there and he has that dirty jacket on and all that, and this is really a different person here on the left-hand side. But it's not only that in uh, um, his personality, I would argue that there was also, um, of course, the context around it kind of triggered this coming out of him to some point because um, already in the 1930s there was criticism coming up um, to, um, towards modernist architects um, which said that these kind of cubist, um, cube-like buildings, plain white without any decoration, without any um, anything superficial is an abstract game for the architects. It's something um, the architects develop for their own pleasure for their own aesthetics, but other than they would claim by naming it functionalist, that really doesn't, um, doesn't meet the needs of the people. People need an architecture where they can identify with, where they can feel at home, and a lot of these um, cubic white buildings were conceived to be, um, to be not adequate for um, people. But looking at Le Corbusier's um, work again, his not only that he publicly um, confessed to him being an artist, but also his, um, his objects of references when it comes to developing the architecture or developing it further, they changed. Here um, on the left-hand side, you have the um, version architecture that on the... Um, on the cover has an ocean liner. And if you open the book, there's all about the machinery, um, the engineering, the aesthetic of the engineer and all that. It's the machine and its technology that is his, um, his source of reference when he develops um, the new architecture. From the 1930s on, this changes and you get a lot of um, these objects here, you have um, muscles that he collected um, when walking um, on the beaches and he calls these objects that give him a poetical um, reaction. And subsequently also his architecture changes. But um, this is not what I wanna talk about now, but in terms of art, while in the 20s he was still claiming that art should be only a guest in the house, that basically um, means it could be 
like uh, an Im a painting that you hang up and when this guest in in the house gets too too annoying you can just um kick him out you take the painting and it's gone again from the 1930s on he again thought about ways to bring art back into architecture and one of the um one of the ways would be um, these color, scre color schemes and um, and wallpaper that he develops for um, the firm Salupra, where he says people should have color, people should have um, ornamentation, but not to forget it's him as an architect who decides about that who kind of controls that because he literally says at some point if they start um mixing the own pay their own pain things might get out of ha hand so he develops this um these color schemes that of course then um will be um applied by industry but then again there's also um the pavilion that Jorn was working at. And here you see uh, uh, an image from the interior where, again, he walk, He works a lot with painting um, by using different paints for the different architectural elements, but also, as I said before, with these wall paintings that are paintings that are connected, physically connected to the architecture that you cannot take out anymore um, if it becomes too um, aggravating. So um, he starts parallel to doing these things in the 1930s. He starts writing texts about um, what is subsequently called the synthesis of the arts discourse, because it becomes a whole discourse, especially during the um, the the years after the immediate years after the war in um, Paris, where um, architects, politicians, and artists talk about how um, art could come back into architecture in order to kind of. Um, to fix that missing link that you have between abstract artists, modern architects, and society on the one hand. The idea is that it's important to bring these things together again and to also make people feel comfortable in their homes again. And art is considered um, to be a means, so to say, to... Um, to create or to um, to have this to have this central emotional need for people um, that they couldn't live out or that they couldn't experience in these um, in this purest um, modernist buildings. So already during the world exhibition, Leche and Jorn they do a couple of um, works where they try to promote this idea of the synthesis of the art, but it's always them to control everything. It's them who are kind of the masters and um, people are not um, taking um, initiative themselves, but they are subjects in the spectacles that um, they are creating or, um, or seeing. Then Jorn, he gets very fascinated by this idea because, as I said before, he's not an artist who wants to be exhibited in the bourgeois temple of the museum. He wants to go out to the people. He wants to change something. He's also interested in contributing to build up a new society. So he engages into this debate of the synthesis of the arts um, by publishing and writing in several different journals, both um, published in Central Europe, mainly Paris and, um, and Italy, but mainly also in 
Um, Northern Europe Forum is a magazine in post-war Netherlands, but then also Bukmesterin and um, Hel Heston A5, they are in Scandinavia. Um, again, he in the beginning praises um, Le Corbusier, but that um, in a way changes. Um, Le Corbusier in the 1950s then even makes a project where he kind of um, illustrates what he was thinking about with this synthesis of the arts in his texts from the 1930s. And it's a kind of um, pavilion project in Paris where artists should work and also should exhibit. And um, the thing is what he, how he conceives himself is always that he's the um, maître d'oeuvre, he's the master of everything. And that's something um, that is also um, what Le Corbus, uh, what Oscar Jorn criticizes him for because it's always him looking from above here also when you see where he looks at one of the architectural schemes, he doesn't see himself inside the whole, but he looks from above. So um, only 10 years after Jorn is so much fascinated um, about him, he starts um, severely criticizing him. And he says, basically, um, Le Corbusier himself works to undermine the fundamental joy in people's lives. And when he views nature in the same way, the devil looks at the Bible. So we might want to ask ourselves, what has happened now? Why was he in the beginning, 10 years before, so fascinated and now all of a sudden so um, critical about it? Um, there is in 1946, immediately after the war, Le Corbusier gets to build the first unité in Marseille, which is his idea about um, the, um, the machine to live in. And it's basically the built notion of all the ideas he already deals with about architect, uh, about housing and urbanism from the time already that Jorn was with him. And that building is also interesting in a way because um, if you look at the roof garden, which basically looks like a sculpture and the color scheme also, you can make a discourse about Le Corbusier's idea about how the synthesis of art should work in that housing building, which is basically nothing else than a whole city in one building. Now, five or, oh my God. Okay, so then I have to be really quick. Jorn starts to um, criticize him about that building very much. He criticizes him um, saying that he's someone who wants to control people in the environment. He says that he looks at people, um, the nature from above rather than being in it. And he says that Le Corbusier's way to work on the um, proportions as the basis of architecture is elitist and it doesn't fit real life, which is in constant movement and constant change. And in the end, he says, um, functionalism is based on exclusively rational um, issues and therefore um, it's doomed to fail because it lacks emotion. At the same time, though, um, he surprises us by saying, um, even though he criticizes for what I just said, um, Le Corbusier, in he says he's still um, the master architectonic artist. So what is meant by that? And now I have 
that's something about weaving. I could cut there, but otherwise. Okay. Um, it's that time when um, in post war Paris, weaving um, sees a renaissance. And that is also because the tapestry, again, because of its material quality of being soft and warm is seen as a corrective of cold and um, sharp modern architecture. So it's seen as a means to fix, again, that um, connection. And Le Corbusier here in 1955 develops this huge tapestry for the high court in uh, um, Shandiga. Jorn and Wemar took earlier already, even earlier than that, um, they took an interesting in weaving because in 1938, um, Jorn took Wemar to a trip up to Norway to see some of Edvard Munch's um, artworks. And they see a Norwegian farmer's woman weaving. And they are very fascinated by that and start experimenting with that as well. And then after the war, um, Jorn goes on a trip, or he wants to go on a trip to um, Tunisia and get stuck with Wemar in, uh, um, in France because of visa, visa issues. So they start again um, with weaving, and um, they do it collaboratively. And um, they also want to, they say they want to revolutionize the whole weaving. Um, and here they make this little tapestry bird in the forest, which will be the basis of a much bigger tapestry um, that they both create around the same time or just slightly after um, Le Corbusier created the, um, the Shandiga tapestries. It's important to realize it's Jorn's first public um, commission in uh, um, a new building, a school building in Aarhus, which um, nowadays is considered to be one of the finest examples of Danish functionalist architecture. Now, um, okay, then I just, I keep my mouth shut and run And I even, I realize I should have started from the back. <laughs> because this is about, he criticizes Le Corbusier about um, the division of labor because he only, he creates a design which then gets transferred by a painter <laughs> or another craftsperson and then gets to the working people and they basically, they um, create sketches of this tapestry and want to create it like, uh, in a spontaneous manner, like a jazz music. Um, in the end, um, they are totally overwhelmed. The two men are unable to um, finish the work as they think they could on themselves. So they have to get a couple of women in <laughs> and um, that's the last um, one. I'm sorry about the delay. <laughs>